Good Heels Podcast, episode 94. Since my book came out, so many people are telling me the way that they're incorporating juicing now. And one person told me that she loves chewing. So she's doing a pretty hardcore juice fast, but she's also eating kale chips at night. <laughs> Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put in their Lululemons and take a yoga class while drinking a green juice. If you experience any of these symptoms, text your priest immediately. All right, welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. And I'm Susie Hardy. Today, we bring you another fellow podcaster, Jasmine Singer. She's an author and an animal rights activist who embraced a plant-based lifestyle to free herself from food addiction. Jasmine's first book, Always Too Much and Never Enough, is one woman's journey to find her herself through juicing, veganism, and love, as she went from fat to thin and from feeding her emotions to feeding her soul. Jasmine lost over 100 pounds, and I just love this quote of hers. Jasmine says, Once I let go of the belief that I would not be somebody until the world said so, I saw myself for who I really was, and I found and I dug her. <laughs> as Jasmine lost weight and, quote, became comfortable in my own skin, I replaced the pounds with a firm commitment to speak up for all the underdogs being kicked around by a world that passes judgment too easily. We just had to quote her in her own words because we couldn't say it better ourselves. No, not at all. <laughs> Jasmine lives in New York City with her wife, animal law professor, Marianne Sullivan, and their rescued pit bull, Rose. And she has a podcast, also the name of her business, Our Hen House, which is a nonprofit multimedia hub working to change the world for animals since 2010. She is a regular public speaker on the subjects of veganism and activism and holds a master's degree in experiential health and healing, right up my alley, mm -hmm. as well as a holistic health certificate from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. But before we get to our interview with Jasmine, we have to tell you about today's sponsor. Our sponsor today is Thrive Market, which I am completely and totally self-admittedly obsessed with. <laughs> Thrive Market <laughs> is a membership-based online shopping club on a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. For less than $5 a month, which is $59.95 annually, Thrive Market members can buy the best-selling healthy foods and wholesome products in everyday sizes. And it's always 25 to 50% below retail prices. And you can't say that for these other grocery stores, right? It's like Costco and Whole Foods had a baby. It's like a super healthy, large-sized baby at affordable <laughs> prices, right? <laughs> Exactly. And Susie, I'm also about to blow your mind right now because did you know that they have essential oils for like 43% off retail price? What? <laughs> really? I swear. I did not know that. And I do. I work with essential oils all the time. They're very healing and they're very costly because it takes a lot of plant to make an essential oil. So the fact that they can find a way to make it affordable, that's amazing. Susie, I just bought lemon essential oil for $4. I don't believe you. <laughs> I'm going to have to go order some myself. I don't believe her. <laughs> Look it up. It's true, Food Heals Nation. I would never lie to you. And when you become a member, thrivemarket.com will donate a free membership to a low-income family, a teacher, or a military family because they believe that we should all thrive together. And I just love that. That's awesome. Like That's the future of companies, right? It really is. They're really like putting out a model that everybody can get behind. It's sustainable and it's helping everyone. You never have to pay full price for healthy food again. Go to thrivemarket.com slash food heals to get your three month free membership plus 15% off your first purchase. Three months Food Heals Nation. They told me that they usually only offer one month or two months. So we got three. Thank you, Thrive. <laughs> so start shopping now and save on your favorite natural wholesome products delivered straight to your door for free. That is thrivemarket.com slash food heals. Next up, our interview with Jasmine. The Food Heals Podcast starts now. 
All right, today we're here with writer and animal rights activist Jasmine Singer. After battling obesity and food addiction, Jasmine became a vegetarian and then vegan after watching a factory farming video. And Jasmine learned the hard way that it is possible to be an unhealthy vegetarian and finally traded in her Oreos and pizza for healthier choices. With Jasmine's newfound confidence, she went from being a bullied fat kid to an activist. And Jasmine now eats, breathes, and sleeps animal rights alongside her wife. Welcome, Jasmine. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. We're really excited to talk to you. And so can you just give us a little bit about yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm Jasmine. <laughs> <She's dead. laughs> and uh, Last time I checked, I was. And I am the author of the memoir, Always Too Much and Never Enough, which just came out in February. And it, I'm currently on a book tour with it. So it is a roundabout journey toward seeking and looking for personal authenticity, which for me is something that really started when I learned the ways I was being betrayed, really, by the food industry and in particular big ag or factory farming. And so as I picked that apart, I also started to pick apart all of the ways I was betraying myself. I also run our hen house, which is a nonprofit that produces media for people who want to change the world for animals. And we are most notably known for the Our Hen House podcast, which is now in its seventh year. And we also have the Teaching Jasmine How to Cook Vegan podcast and the Animal Law podcast. That's awesome. You are a media rock star. Yeah, I was going to say anything else. That's a lot. (laughs) That's a couple of of other things, but I thought I would just, you know, take a breather. (laughs) No, that's plenty. I'm I'm being sarcastic. Yeah, no, I know. Thank you so much, though, that I I appreciate all that you're doing with your show. It's it's exciting that more and more podcasts are, are out there with different beats, but all working to change the world for animals by way of food or health or ethics and and lots of other different ways as well. Thank you. Yeah, our podcast is Food Heals, but we go beyond the food. We think nutrition is number one, but then we also talk about all the other things that, you know, really affect our health and affect our environment and affect ourselves. So we're so glad to have you. Can you go back to the beginning and really tell us, like, how did you start? Why did you become vegetarian? Why did you become vegan? Why did you decide to change your life? And why did you start this empire that you have today? Yeah, absolutely. I went vegetarian when I was a young theater student living in in Philadelphia. I was about 19. And it was really the first time that I had given any thought to how food was produced and where food came from. Before then, it had just magically appeared on my plate. Mm-hmm. And I had really grown up in the fluorescent 1980s when I'm not even sure we owned any dishes. We always used to just eat those little Weight Watchers meals, those tiny little cardboard squares that you would microwave. And yeah, yeah, and it would never ever microwave all the way through. The middle was always frozen. Gross. Oh no. It was, it was so disgusting for so many reasons, but especially because the last bite was totally frozen through. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so when I was in college, which is of course the first time so many of us think about food and where and where it it comes from or or how we want to consume it, that was the first time I decided that meat was icky. And I became a vegetarian mainly because I was seeking an identity. And I used to wear all black and smoke clove cigarettes. And I thought that vegetarian seemed to suit who I wanted to be in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So at first you were this unhealthy vegan because it's very easy to do, right? You know, there's so many products out, out there that are actually vegan that are very chemical laden, filled with crap that we don't need. And so what made you switch from the unhealthy vegan to the healthy vegan? Well, I grew up as a bullied fat kid trying to stuff my chubby self into my thin mother's shadow. Mm. And she was always trying to go from 122 pounds to 120 and and dragging me with her to Weight Watchers meetings and Nutrisystem meetings and Jenny Craig meetings. And food was always just a way to... Uh, accomplish weight loss. Wow. Uh, or it was it was never about satisfaction or nourishment, never ever. Mm. And by the time I went vegetarian, all I ate was macaroni and cheese and cheese omelets and cheese pizza. And then when I went vegan, I had simply replaced a lifetime of negative body image stuff and also a disordered mentality around eating and food with the vegan version of it. Mhm. I became an activist uh, full time and I just, 
thought, well, hey, there's this amazing vegan cupcake on the Lower East Side and this fantastic vegan pizza on the Upper West Side and this outstanding Butterfinger shake in Brooklyn. And it was sort of my moral obligation to try them all. Hey, (laughs) I support that. (laughs) Yeah, it was for the animals. And honestly, that's something I, you know, I still love a good, I love a good cupcake or a good pizza or, or a nice beer. But I have a different mentality about it now. And that's because I had a big scare when I was 30. Let's talk about that. I was really sick and unhealthy. I'd been vegan for many years at that point. And I was told I was on my way to heart disease. I weighed in the 220s. And I was just, I had adult onset acne. I Mm. was fatigued constantly. I was achy all the time. And I, I've been writing for Veg News for over 10 years now. And I was out in San Francisco and I was meeting with the publishers and they had an advanced press copy of the film Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead. And I know that Joe was recently on your show, right? Mm-hmm. Joe Cross? Yeah, we love Joe. Joe. Yeah, so do I. And so, of course, as you know, and probably most of your listeners already know, his first film fat sick and nearly dead talked about how he tried to cure himself of autoimmune disorder through Mm -hmm. going on a juice fast and this was right on the heels of me being told i was on my way to heart disease my triglycerides were extremely high and i was just so tired tired physically and also just emotionally so i decided to try it i went on a juice fast and it was the first time i had ever consumed a vegetable in my life really no obviously i'm exaggerating a little bit but for the most part i pushed them to the side five-year-old style you know right it is amazing i'm going to interrupt you right here because i dated a lovely man before i got married he was East Indian. He was vegetarian all his life because his father was was East Indian and that's the way he was raised. And he never ate vegetable. I'm sorry. He ate potatoes. He ate <laughs> potatoes. He ate pizza. He ate, you know, he ate cheese. He was not vegan. He was vegetarian. He never ate vegetables. And I thought, you are the most unhealthy vegetarian I have ever seen. I ate more vegetables than he did. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And it was, and so that sounds like what you were experiencing. He also had very high, his dad was a doctor and he had very high triglycerides. And that was the time I learned what triglycerides were. And it was an indication that he was eating the wrong type of carbohydrates, not eating enough minerals and, and getting enough vitamins into his system. And it sounds like you were on the same path. Yeah. I mean, when, and back when I was a vegetarian, before I was vegan, this was a long time ago now, I was so unhealthy. Like when I went to college, I transferred schools in the middle. And by the time I transferred to Pace in New York City, I had brought with me these little single servings of mac and cheese that all that they came in their own little styrofoam container and you just pop them in the microwave. So in addition to how unbelievably unhealthy they were and void of anything nutritious, they were they were these little styrofoam bowls. They were terrible on the planet. So I was completely unconscious about my consumption habits for myself, my body and my planet. And then, yeah, when I went vegan, it was like I worked hard. I worked long, hard hours and I sort of felt I deserved this. What I didn't realize was that I had been hiding behind these rows and rows of Oreos that I had been consuming uh, mindlessly my entire life as a way of just shielding myself from a whole lot of pain that I had never dealt with from back when I was a bullied kid. That was actually something that really helped inform my activism, how quickly we can marginalize others and cast them aside and then celebrate the ones we want to celebrate. Mm. That coming from being a bullied kid helped to embolden me later to be an activist. Well, I was was watching the video on your website earlier today about you had one phrase that summed that up perfectly, that I was like, oh, that's her story right there, that if she hadn't gone through that, maybe she wouldn't be the activist that she is today, which was you went from being a bullied fat kid to fighting for the underdogs, i.e. animals, that you see that can't fight for themselves. And I thought exactly there, if you hadn't gone through that, maybe, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't be the person you are today and fighting for animal rights. Yeah, I I like to believe that that's a silver lining for sure. I mean, we're all just the sum of our parts and of our experiences. And it's do you remember the Choose Your Own Adventure book? Yes. Yeah. 
I love this. I think about that all the time. Turn to page 37 if you want Billy to go to the park. Right. Turn to page 59 <laughs> if Billy should go to the movies or something. <laughs> like, unfortunately, life doesn't work like that. And we can't turn the page on our own story and say, well, what if we had gone down that other road mm-hmm. instead? Mm-hmm. But I, I do think that for me, it was a very personal connection. And, you know, that extended because when I finally became healthy, I went on a juice fast every single month for three years. And in between, I followed Eat to Live Mm -hmm. and I wound up losing nearly 100 pounds. But what wound up happening in addition to finding health and vibrancy and a lot of truths about myself that I had not faced before, I also wound up being treated very differently by society as a thin person than I had as a fat person. So that further informed my activism. What was that like? It was weird. It created a a little chip on my shoulder or maybe not so little chip on my shoulder at first. (laughs) And, you know, it was like I always knew that my view of the world would would change when I lost weight. I never totally anticipated how enthusiastically the world's view of me would change. And I knew that I was being treated sort of as an outsider my whole life, especially when I was a young, obese adult trying to make it as an actor in New York City. but when I lost the weight, it was these, it was just the pile of, upon pile of subtle, subtle things that were happening to me. Men holding doors, women complimenting my blazer. I remember distinctly being on the corner of like 35th and park and I wanted a cup of coffee and I saw a bunch of guys holding some Starbucks and I was like, excuse me, where did you get your coffee? And they like all but escorted me to the nearest Starbucks, which was subtle. It just sounds like, oh, those are nice guys. But let me tell you, when you're 220 some odd pounds, it doesn't happen like that so much. Right. So it was confusing and a little infuriating, but ultimately it was liberating when I was able to parse it out in my book and help inform my activism through my personal personal experiences. And how have you made peace with that now? Or have you? It's an interesting question. I think it's an ongoing process. I think it depends on the day. I mean, I think I I sometimes wonder if I will ever feel completely out of that cycle of mental of, of like the mental process of wondering what certain people's intentions are, but mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to go through life jaded and I like to believe that people are oftentimes inherently good, not always, but so I have to just trust and open my heart in different ways. And that was something I had to do to myself. I had to open my heart to myself in the process of learning about all of my own truths, my sexuality, my what, what I could bring into relationships, friendships, and more in an authentic way. Whereas before I was I was really under the influence really of being a food addict and living in in denial about about my body and about my view of my body. So once I was able to really heal from that, I, I was able to show up in a way I had never shown up before. So that was what my book really centers around. I mean, it's amazing. It sounds like you really encompass the holistic approach of mind, body, spirit healing, because it's not about just one thing the nutrition. It's not, it's about all the other things that go with it. And especially the emotions tied in because it's like losing weight is very emotional. And why was it there in the first place dealing with those issues with what you went through with your mother and who knows what else and the bullying, you know, those are very, very strong things that stay with us. And there are some people that lose the weight and they don't heal the emotions. And so it all comes back. And so kudos to you for figuring that out, you know, and being able to heal that. Well, thank you. I just want to make one clarification, which is that, well, and I appreciate you're saying that that's really true for sure. That was, that came as a result of not basing my weight loss on the numbers on the scale, Mm -hmm. but basing them on actually paying attention to what I needed. Self-care. Imagine that. (laughs) But I I do want to make one clarification, which is that I feel as though the bottom line for any of us is not the numbers on the scale, but it is finding peace within our bodies. And I think that within a pretty broad scope that can encompass many different sizes. For me, as I found peace within my body, I lost a lot of weight. I think that there's other people for whom they would find peace within their body 
but their body would still be bigger. It's yes. just, you know, there's a fine line there and the fine line is morbid obesity, which is where, you know, I was, I was obese, but I, I'm not here to judge anyone who is happy and larger as long as they're, you know, as long as they have peace within their body and they're living in a way that is consistent with their ethical beliefs. I say more power to you. Totally agree. And different body types and different body shapes, you can be at optimal health and weigh more than someone smaller or weighing less that, and you can be much more healthy than them. So it's really not an indication of your total health and well-being, you know, your size, except when you're talking about obviously obesity and things like that. Well, the reason that the book came to be was because I wrote an article for Mind Body Green that went viral, which was called what I learned about how the world treated me differently after losing a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. It actually was called something else, but it was close enough to that. Title. Wait, you wrote this. <laughs> you wrote this or someone it, else? It, I wrote it. Yeah, I wrote okay. it for, for Mind Body Green and it got like a hundred thousand shares in 24 hours. Or wow. Something, something like that. And you know, it really touched on something. It pissed people off and it made people also feel as though I was telling their story. That was ultimately what led to the book deal. But I, I will say that we probably do all oppress others in ways that we're not consciously aware of. And that to me is a thought that humbles me every day and keeps me what I hope is like not, not incredibly preachy because I feel like I have a lot to learn and I have certainly, I, I, I was in the unique position of having jumped the fence from someone that the world sort of arbitrarily decided was less than to some, someone that the world arbitrarily celebrated or at least accepted. And because I'm on that side of the fence now, I've definitely found myself acting toward others in ways that if I stopped and looked at it, I'd be like, whoa, check yourself, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. So remaining open eyed and open hearted to the ways we continue to oppress others who are told are to us by society are less than is, is a, is a really, really important way of moving through the world, I think. Yeah. So you said that you do one juice fast a month. Is that correct? Every year? For a month? The first three years, I did a juice fast every month, 10 days, one month, then three days, the next, then 10, then three, then 10, then three. I don't do that right now because I'm on a pretty rigorous book tour right. doing up to five events a week. Wow, that's a lot. Okay. So first, tell us, what did the juice fast entail? Did you kind of follow what Joe Cross did? What did you did you take supplements? Did you just drink green juice? What did that look like? I started off by following Joe's program. And then as I became a self expert in it, I, I wound up making tweaks that were things that worked for me within the scope of what he talked about doing. So I, I did five juices a day at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I would say most of them were green juices. They were not those straight up green juices, they had a little bit of apple or pear in them for a bit of sweetness. Sure. Sinner. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. And then, <laughs> and then eventually I had six juices a day because that really worked better for me. Mm -hmm. So I was able to figure that out. And it was so much easier than I thought it would be. It was actually not that bad. Like the, I wasn't hungry all the time. You know, the main thing I had to do was kind of do my life, but a little like with a little less volume. So I still moved through my life the way I normally did, but I wouldn't, you know, plan a, a shit ton of extra sure. events, you know, and I would, I would also try to not do social things too much unless it was a friend who wanted to meet for tea or something. Cause I eventually started to incorporate herbal tea into it. And then we went out to Portland for six. I live in New York City, but we went out to Portland for six months because Marianne was a visiting professor of animal law out there. And her schedule became so rigorous that we started to buy the juices instead of making them. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of was another switch for us. And then that program had nut milks as one of the juices. So, I love uh, nut milks. Yeah. So at the beginning, for the first couple of years, there were no nut milks involved. But then then I was also training for a half marathon mm -hmm. at that point. So I really appreciated the extra calories. During the juice fast? 
Yeah, wow. I have to say, probably not my best move of all time. <laughs> um, it, it, it was bold. It was it's a bold, bold move. Yeah, it was bold, but I, I did eventually. Then I started to turn the juices into smoothies and add some protein powder mm -hmm. when I was doing the runs the longer runs but that that was probably not that was probably one of my mistakes i shouldn't have been juice fasting while i was training for a half marathon <laughs> but you know it was not that bad like i was able to do it i was getting enough calories but you that the, you kind of live and learn and you figure out you figure out what works for you and what doesn't since my book came out so many people are telling me the way that they're incorporating juicing now and one person told me that she loves chewing so she's doing a pretty hardcore juice fast but she's also eating kale chips at night <laughs> and like she makes them herself in her dehydrator i think and she's and you know like that's cool that's what works for her that's what i love about this it's oh, not it's I, not a how-to book it's really just my story and what worked for me yeah and it's amazing. I, I think your story is fantastic. Speaking of chewing, I, I did a bit of a juice fast recently and the instructions I got along with it was that you should chew the juices because it activated enzymes in your saliva that would help. I, I was like, I got to, mm -hmm. do, it said, don't chug, chew your juice. And I was like, really? I got to <laughs> chew my juice? But, but I did it. I did it. But that makes sense because the act of chewing does release those digestive enzymes. And so when I take those, clen when I do my cleanses, I'm taking the digestive enzymes. I'm, I'm taking them physically. So if you can make your body produce them himself, yourself, why not? I chewed my juice. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> I've heard that before about chewing too. And I think, again, it's all about sort of figuring out what works for us. And if you do it and you feel good about it, then cool. Yeah. So tell us about trust in the juice. Well, the juice fasting was something that I always felt was first and foremost a mental break for me. Mm-hmm. It's actually similar to my running, which isn't really about physical health for me. It's a nice side benefit. But it became, the juicing became about taking a break from my very, very hectic schedule. And as I mentioned a moment ago, turning down the volume a little bit. And whatever toxic behavior I had started to, you know, had started to sort of inch its way up in my life in the period between the juices, I would, I would be able to take inventory during my break from eating solid foods and let that go. And that wasn't always like food. It wasn't always like a cupcake addiction that came in. It was sometimes people. It was sometimes an addiction to my email. It was sometimes an addiction to, you know, caffeine that was just starting to creep its way back in. And the juicing would allow me to press reboot, which is Joe's term, yeah, and just start again. So I knew I could trust in the juice because I, I always knew that there was another juice fast on the calendar. And so you did that for three years where you did one juice fast a month, right? And what do you do now in terms of juicing? Do you juice daily? Do you juice whenever you feel like it? How does that work? I think that, well, I'm going to answer your question from like where I am right now yeah. as we're talking, because it's going to change after my book tour is over. And it was different before my book tour began. Sure. But right now, just given my travel schedule and given how many events I'm doing, I am incorporating juice into my days, but I haven't done a juice fast in a few months, not since like late last year, I think. And that's just because I'm not in one place for long enough. Yeah. I'm, I'm often in one city at a t for one day or two days, but I do start every day out off with a, a healthy green smoothie, even when I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. And that's super easy because you can bring a, a greens powder and you can usually get some fruit from the like motel if you're staying there or, or if I'm lucky to stay with someone a lot of people are like what do you want and I'm like a green smoothie would make me so happy yeah and <laughs> I'll try and get a juice like in the day at some point either as a meal or as a snack but I haven't actually done a juice fast in a bit of time really looking forward to when I can do one next which is hopefully next month so do you bring a little blender with you or do you ask like the hotel if they have a blender you can use? How do you do that? I usually bring a little travel blender, but I misplaced it. <laughs> and so after I misplaced it, I just got one of those blender bottles that, you know, you shake. Mm hmm. It, you get it for like five bucks at the grocery store. And so I'll, I'll also carry around a little bit of protein powder packets with me. 
And I could even mix that with water. So that's not exactly juicing. And there's fiber intact with that. There's fiber intact with the little single serving blender, travel blenders as well. But and so that's a whole different experience than juicing, but it's still really healthy. And it's a great way of just giving your body a whole lot of nutrients first thing in the morning. Yeah, I think it's a great way to stay healthy on the road because it's hard when you're traveling. I know for me, usually when I land and I get off the plane, I'm just Googling where's the nearest Whole Foods because most cities and towns don't have the access to all these organic vegan places, juice places like LA does, like New York does. Now, some places do. So if you can be lucky enough to find that, but usually I'm just Googling where is the nearest place that I can find some fruits and vegetables, you know, get my juice, get my smoothie. So that I can sustain my lifestyle because just because I'm traveling, you know, you feel a lot worse after you get on planes, trains and automobiles, right? So you've got to even give yourself more energy. So you can't be eating this horrible airplane food. You know, LAX is the only place I know of that has um, real food daily. Real <laughs> food daily. And I'm like, American Airlines, I only fly American for that fact alone. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, other than that, it's really hard to stay healthy on the road. So do you have any other tips for staying healthy on the road or how you do it? Well, first I have an anecdote, which will lead to a tip, which is basically that since I'm traveling so much, a lot of people are like, oh, you have to try the vegan restaurant in this city. And of course I want to. It's also good fodder for our hen house. Yeah. But oftentimes their special item will be the fried Big Mac with the vegan version. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, at the beginning of my tour, I was like, okay, yeah, I want to try all this. And I just, I, I just started to feel so awful yeah. like physically <laughs> like wait and I do like having stuff like that every now and then sure I do very 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 much like I love food I think it's incredibly sexy to eat it it's a sensual experience sure I love I just I'm so satisfied by it I love eating but like I was in Phoenix recently and a the person I was staying with was like what do you like to eat And I said, well, a green smoothie. So I had that for breakfast. And she said, what else? And I said, my favorite thing is a macro plate. That's just, it always makes me feel balanced. You know, like you got your tofu, you got your rice, you got your beans, you got your greens. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have like some tahini dressing on it. And so she found a place that, that had a macro plate for me. And we went there before I did my speaking engagement, which was at a fantastic vegan restaurant, which was very well known for its deep fried foods. I just know that, I'm in front of crowds all the time. I have to be at my best. And the only way I'm going to be is if I'm, if I'm taking care of myself. So other tips for the road, I would say definitely make sure you get your vegetables in, in the morning if you can. Mm -hmm. And worst case scenario, if you don't have your little blender with you, the most motels that you're staying at, offer oatmeal and they'll have the plain oatmeal. And so if you just take plain oatmeal and water, And you can even add a little bit of fruit to that. That's a really healthy breakfast. And you could get that for free at any hotel Mm -hmm. (laughs) that offers breakfast. So don't forget about that, you know. And then other tips for staying healthy. You know, I'm a New Yorker, so I walk all the time. And I think it's really easy when visiting other cities to just get into the car because it's not necessarily a walking city. So I would say definitely get outside every day. And I'm not going to be that person who says exercise every day, even though, you know, I do believe in exercising for sure. All I'm saying here is get outside every day and move around Yes, and move your body. So that would be another way of staying healthy on the road. And, you know, split dessert. I I, I don't want to say don't have dessert, Mm -hmm. but split it or order it for the table and take a bite. Have a little dessert. Yeah, or have a whole dessert if you want to, but make it a conscious decision. (laughs) And be happy about it. Don't judge yourself after you do it. Yeah, I'm just saying that we need to ask our bodies and our hearts what we need. And if you actually stop and ask yourself that question first, what do I need right now? This is something I'm struggling with right now. Like today, for example, I'm having, I had like a, a lot of stuff come at me today, a lot of emotional stuff. And I had to keep stopping and saying, what do I need right now? Mm -hmm. What do I need? I need to just get outside to have a change of perspective. Sometimes like if you could just go upside down somehow, like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it literally changes your perspective. (gasps) I can't believe you just said that. 
Why? Because I had a flashback not too long ago. I love doing yoga and I love doing headstands in particularly. Not handstands, but headstands. Mm -hmm. Uh Because I can't do the handstands. I don't have enough. I'm working on them. But the headstands where you're balancing on your head, I love them. And I had a flashback one day where when I was a little kid growing up in Long Island, I would run full speed onto my, like from the stairs onto my parents' couch and flip upside down and my legs would be up against the wall and I would be doing a a headstand on a couch of all places. (laughs) And I loved it. I I was looking at the, the, I was looking at the world upside down and I had this flashback more recently where I was like, I used to do this as a kid Mm -hmm. and now I do it nowadays and it's incredible and it's incredibly great in terms of a yogic perspective And for me, when I'm super stressed, when I can't handle anything, when all I want to do is run for something naughty and sugar laden and bad, I'm like, I need to go on my head. I need to flip my (laughs) legs above me. I think that's a great instinct. I mean, kids and and it's totally true that as a kid, you did it because kids just sort of innately know how to do that kind of thing. We swing on the monkey bars. Yeah. And And by the way, just for the record, for anybody listening to this, I don't do yoga. I'm not particularly bendy. I I know that's why I should do yoga, but I don't. (laughs) But I still try and go upside down just by like kind of maneuvering my body so that I'm like my head is beneath my butt my butt's up in the air right. like, I'm sure I look like I'm in twi- like twister like you're playing twister uh-huh. like that kind of position yeah so it's literally like any t- any way you could get your head below your butt it changes <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> there's many ways <laughs> <laughs> or shake like jump up and down and shake or do like five it just it changes your perspective it, it, does. it shifts the energy around in the mood it really in, does in, and in I think room. and I think that's what you said where, where I was like yes it does change your perspective and when you change your perspective things shift and you may not make you know, the wrong choice for the bad food or you may not be in such a bad mood anymore. It, it literally flips everything on its head well, exercise. Oh, literally, yeah. I mean, exercise is really powerful because they say it's just as powerful as taking an antidepressant, you know, and we do not recommend antidepressants. So go work out. And also going upside down is really good for your organs and your digestion. Except when you're on your moon cycle, your lady cycle. Then you shouldn't go upside your down. Your menses, your period, et cetera. You okay. should not go upside down. That's what they say so in yoga. That's, that's, yeah, I mean, I'm a runner and I like an amateur runner, but a runner. And mm-hmm. I like to run in different cities that I'm in. But And I just, by the way, I don't take antidepressants, but I would argue that there are scenarios where they would, I would definitely think that they would be good for people to take. But I, I understand your point that they're overprescribed. I mean, I certainly was prescribed them as I talk about in my book and I shouldn't have been when I was in college and they completely ruined everything. But I know a lot of people who would be dead without antidepressants. I think that they are only a temporary solution and they are prescribed as a permanent solution. And that's what I don't agree with. Yeah, I'm with that for sure. I just wanted to, I just, I don't think across the board you could say, oh, antidepressants are like, I mean, I I have a degree, my master's is in experiential health and healing. Like I'm all about healing things from a holistic level as much as we possibly can. But I think that there is, and I think that the pharmaceutical industry as a whole is just disgusting. Yeah. But, (laughs) but I do think that there is a place for allopathic medicine and we'd probably all be dead without it. We we agree. Allison was referring to uh, actually a psychiatrist in New York who I saw gave me the statistic that physical exercise where you break a sweat three to five times a week is as effective for 30 minutes at a time is as effective as antidepressants. And that's what he was like, you can go on the drugs or you can try exercise your choice. And he was very expensive and he was very highly recommended. That's what she was referring to. We are not here sitting in judgment of anybody, but um, not at all. We we offer other solutions and at least because we've both experienced it in terms of anxiety and depression. That's all she was referring to. Yeah. And I was put on antidepressants and they made me absolutely crazy. And so I know for me, they were not a solution and they were not a temporary solution either. But for some people they are. And I just want to make sure that everyone knows is that they are temporary. And then once you discover all the other things that some of the things like we're talking about today that you can do for your body, Mm -hmm. that will help you get over that depression as well as heal yourself emotionally, as well as go back to the traumas that you've experienced and really feel them. You got to feel it to heal it. So you can heal yourself of depression. You can heal yourself of anxiety. You can heal yourself of all these diseases 
And if you need drugs temporarily, that's absolutely fine. But we just don't believe that you need them for the rest of your life in most cases. Agreed. I'm sure yeah, there agree. are some cases where you do, yeah. but generally they're just overprescribed, like you said. Oh, yeah. I had a bad experience with it that I talk about in my book. And I'm just so grateful that that I like running because I, I was mm. always the kid that hated gym class. And yeah. <laughs> used to fake cramps to get out of it. And I, I was like, I had lost. 75 pounds before I even started running. So I was in my early Mm thirties when I picked up running shoes for the first time. And it was, it was a scary moment because I never had moved my body in that way. Yeah. And I wound up loving it, but not because of, Oh, I got to get physically fit. Just like with the food, it was about just a way of being with myself and a way of, of feeling weightless and feeling like, feeling like self propelled and Speaking of exercise, I need to really step up the game with my weightlifting. I don't do it very often, but I know that the stronger you get physically, the stronger you you can feel emotionally too. So that's Mm -hmm. something I'm currently battling with. I'm definitely not there at all, but it's, it's kind of the thing I'm focusing on at the moment. That's awesome. And what does running do for you? I know for a lot of people, it can be like meditation because you're getting away from everything. You're in your own element. You can be in silence in some cases. Um, I know a lot of people like music or podcasts, which is great too, but you're really getting away from the texts and the emails and all the stress we have all day. So what does it do for you? Yeah. I mean, you basically just said the most of what it does for me. And also I carry so much stuff with me and I mean that literally, but also <laughs> also not literally. Right. Uh, I just, I, I'm always carrying bags. Like my office is, is mobile. So I have my computer and then I have the computer cord and I have the, this, and like, like all of us, I just have a bunch of crap. I don't even know what it is. And so I love just feeling like I can just have nothing with me and be totally anonymous and zigzag through the world. And, and it also on an emotional level, it helps me deal with shit. Like when my grandmother died and my book is dedicated to my grandmother, you know, it really, it, I feel like I dealt with the grief of her dying through running Mm. and I would like weep while I was running. I just remember this one run I took in New York city. I was living in Soho at the time. So it was like right on the Hudson river right over there. And I just remember it was from a run that I broke through the denial and realized that she was dying Mm. and it was so painful, but then it was just ultimately healing to be able to continue to physically move through the space helped me to move through the emotional space as well. That's beautiful. I mean, I love that story because I think how powerful, you know, it's moving your body to move your thoughts forward and and to get to that self-realization as painful as it is was like that was your breakthrough moment I think that's amazing thanks yeah it's I have to often remind myself Jasmine go running today you know just do it and you'll feel better you never yeah you're never like oh why did I do that you're always like thank god I did that (laughs) well and I like I was actually just interviewed for women's health about tips on getting your butt to work out when you don't want to and one of the things I said is all right if you don't want to just promise yourself 10 minutes and if after 10 minutes you still don't want to go home yeah that's cool it, I, I will basically guarantee that if you're out there and it's 10 minutes, you're going to keep going yep. uh, for at least a half an hour, which is usually the amount I work out is just a half an hour. I think that's but you could do anything for 10 minutes. I think that's great advice. I do the same thing with my writing when I don't want to sit down and write my screenplay. I'm like, I'll do 10 minutes. And if at 10 minutes I'm ready to quit, I can quit. And it's I think giving yourself attainable goals and limits and like almost like bargaining with yourself, like. You can just do this small amount and you do often find that you, you will find that you will go farther. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like we, we all come up with the tricks we need to play on ourselves. <laughs> that kind of, how can we manipulate ourselves to write or to, but yeah. But I mean, you're right. You could do anything for 10 minutes. Right. It's going to be different things for different people. And just like my, the person who contacted me and said she does a juice fast, but eats kale chips, like that works for her. And a modified version of what I just said will work for someone else regarding 10 minutes. And, and, you know, you can make it easier for yourself by, for me, I lay out my gym, my uh, running clothes the night before I'm going to go running because it's hard. I don't know how to pick out what I'm going to wear. It's always like, no, that's such good advice. I feel the same way. 
<laughs> yeah. Just lay it out. Make it as easy as possible for yourself. Yeah. Because otherwise, I will spend so much time getting ready for the run that by the time I'm ready to go, I'm like, I could have run two miles by now, you know? And so I like laying it out. It's so simple, but it's so true. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll be right back to talk about Jasmine's business and podcast, Our Hen House. Food Heals Nation, if you're like us, you care a lot about the food that you put into your body because you know that food heals. The problem is that good, healthy food can be extremely expensive, but it doesn't have to be. That's why we were thrilled to discover Thrive Market. ThriveMarket.com is like the Costco for everything healthy online. That's right. It's an online shopping club offering the best brands and groceries up to 50% off retail prices. Ship nationally for free. They have brands that I buy all the time like Simply Organic, Garden of Life, Dr. Bronner's, Tom's, Nutiva, 7th Generation, Gaia, and so many more. So basically everything I'm already buying at Whole Foods, right? Exactly, but at 25 to 50% off. And you can easily filter everything by your preferences. Gluten-free, vegan, raw, non-GMO, organic, and even fair trade. But what I love most about Thrive Market is their charitable cause. For every paid membership, ThriveMarket.com donates a free membership to a low-income family, a teacher, or a military family. How awesome is that? This is a game changer, Food Heals Nation, because you never have to pay full price for healthy foods again. That's why we scored an exclusive discount for you. Yes, so check out Thrive Market and get two months free membership plus 15% off your first order. Join the movement at thrivemarket.com slash foodheals. You are listening to the Food Heals Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. All right, we're back with Jasmine Singer, whose personal story proves that life can always surprise you. She went from being a bullied, overweight child who ate her school lunch in the bathroom stalls to a passionate animal rights activist, tap dancer, and writer. Amazing. Jasmine understands how personal every person's relationship with food really is. She's also passionate about social justice, animal liberation, vegan baked goods, juice fasts, and finding the best black eyeliner on the market, not tested on animals, of course. Of course. So, Jasmine, what is the best black eyeliner on the market, by the way? (laughs) I can't believe you asked me that. I'm so on the spot right now. You're on the spot. <laughs> we got what it do you from use? your website. I'm gonna, I know. I, I, I'm going to say what, I, what I'm what i wearing right now, which is e-l-f. Yeah, I know e-l-f. costs about $3. Oh, yeah. They're super affordable. <laughs> so I think there's other ones that are also really good, but that happens to be the one I'm wearing right now. So that this issue is so close to my heart because I have a beagle and beagles are one of the most tested on animals for makeup and like skincare companies. Are they really? It makes me so mad because they're so docile. You know how <gasps> Charlotte is. She's so sweet. What and the so fuck? There's this uh, company. It makes me mad. I love Charlotte. She's my, she's, well, I'm her auntie. I know. But um, they test all these like products on them. And oh there's a, a, a organization called Beagle Freedom Project who really, really helps get them out of animal testing. But it's heartbreaking. Oh, my God. I know. So thank you for letting us know about Elf. And now tell us about our hen house. It's your business. It's your podcast. Tell us how it started, and really what what you're trying to spread to the world. Thank you. Our Hen House is a nonprofit that I founded with Marianne Sullivan in 2010. And to date, we have over 330 of our signature weekly podcasts. That's called Our Hen House. And you can find that on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever else you listen to podcasts. And we get to talk to celebrities and activists and lawyers and people who are working to change the world for animals. But in addition to that, we provide commentary on news items that pertain to animal rights. Mm -hmm. So Marianne has amazing biting banter about that. We have a segment that people love called Rising Anxieties in which we basically report on what the opposition is saying regarding vegans and veganism and animal rights. And so it's fantastic. That's everyone's favorite segment because all we really have to do is 
report on it and it speaks for itself. We see that as a huge sign of success. That's why we call it rising anxieties. And we also have a review segment uh, where we will review the latest book or film or product that is working to change the world for animals. And we, we have a lot of fun. So we try to be indefatigably positive, even though there's so much to be sad and angry about. We are sad and angry, but ultimately we see hope as a strategy. So we have a lot of fun with that. We've gotten recognized by the Webby Awards twice uh, alongside some pretty big heavy hitters. And so that's been really exciting for us. And that's why last year we started two additional podcasts, the Teaching Jasmine How to Cook Vegan podcast, Mm -hmm. in which I am the befuddled one. (laughs) I'm not. And I'm joined by a chef or a cook or a, a foodie who teaches me how to cook because there was a bit of an intervention where people said, yo, you can't really cook. Let's teach you how. And I said, well, then let's broadcast it because that's my life. So it's perfect for people who are vegan curious or vegan leaning or vegan. And we always make sure it's Jasmine accessible, meaning you can do it too. It's super easy. (laughs) And we'll put the the recipe on the blog that corresponds with it. And then the Animal Law podcast, Marianne teaches Animal Law at Columbia Law School. Mm -hmm. And so she always goes really in the weeds into a actual case going on right now that affects animals. And so she'll talk to a a lawyer who's working on that particular case. And a lot of non-lawyers like that show a lot too. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And that Marianne is a truly brilliant voice for animals. She's been doing this work since the nineties and is a leading force in the animal law movement specifically. So it's exciting. We have an ebook publishing arm called hen press. We're about to publish our our second ebook. We also have an online magazine with thousands of articles. And when I'm not on my book tour, I'm usually touring around giving talks on veganism and activism. So that's what our hen house is. How do you do it all girl? It's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, thank you. I have a good time. I feel very, very lucky. I absolutely love the work that your wife is doing. I feel like we should have her on the show at yeah. some point, whenever she can fit it into her schedule. It sounds like she's very busy. Is there, I, that is something that I didn't even know knew existed. I don't know if that's incredibly uneducated of myself, but is there anything that you can address in, or any case that you know of that she is working on that, she, that you could talk about in terms of animal rights? Well, Marianne is a professor and you should definitely have her on to talk about some specifics, but also just to give a basic Animal Law 101. I think that that might be really interesting. Yeah, I I feel like that's necessary because I didn't even know about that. Yeah, there's now animal law classes in uh, every law school in the country, I think. And that was largely made possible by Bob Barker. As in mm-hmm. Price is Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, he has given millions of dollars to start these programs. And, um, you know, the Non-Human Rights Project with Steve Wise is mm-hmm. probably the most known about, but you should, uh, the most known about current day case affecting animals. And Steve Wise was the guest on the very first Animal Law Podcast episode. So you can find that out over there and, and, and definitely check out some of Marianne's work because it's, it's pivotal. And she's, you know, what we do, just like what you do is we provide the platform. Right. So even though Marianne herself has done a lot of great work in terms of uh, writing about animal law and theorizing and, and, and putting her platform for others to come and show the world the ways that they're working to change the world for animals. Have you guys talked about the ad gag bill in North Carolina on your podcast? Oh, yeah, we've had Will Potter on to discuss that. And Marianne talks about ag gag quite regularly. So they're both on the Our Hen House podcast as well as the Animal Law podcast. And so definitely tune into the Will Potter episode to find out more about that. If you go onto ourhenhouse.org and you type in Will Potter, then I think that 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 episode probably has the most information about it. Okay, great. No, that's really interesting to me because I know North Carolina, which is my home state, just passed the law basically making it illegal to put cameras in slaughterhouses. And that angers me so much because there's no accountability and people can do whatever they want. But at least if they have a camera on them, maybe they won't abuse the animals as badly. And it's not a permanent solution. But the fact that they're trying to let them do whatever they want is disgusting and abhorrent to me. Well, I think the media is with you. So that's um, that's one silver lining there. The media is, for the most part, outraged by ag gag. So I think that, uh, you know, it's all a sign of rising anxieties. And ultimately, I think that this will just be another stepping stone toward hopefully animal liberation, since that's what we're all 
trying to get, right? We're all after, I know. All right. So tell us about your book. Where can everyone find it and buy it and anything else you want to say about it? The book is called Always Too Much and Never Enough, and you could find it wherever books are sold. You could also go to jasminesinger.com, and there's no E on Jasmine, so it's just J-A-S-M-I-N, and you could find all the links there if you want, or just go onto Amazon or Barnes & Noble or go to your local bookstore, and they'll probably have it there, your library, and it's a memoir, and you, there's also an audiobook version in which I narrate it. So you could get it on Audible or you could order the CDs or the MP3s if that's more your speed, so to speak. And <laughs> I have a good time with it. So if you like it, uh, I hope that you consider leaving a friendly review because that always helps. If you don't like it, don't don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> don't leave her a bad review. Don't leave me Nation. a bad review. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Our listeners are pretty positive. I don't think they would do that. So how can everyone find out about your book tour and where you're going to be next? Well, if you go to jasminesinger.com and you click on events, you'll see the latest and greatest. But we're also always posting them to my Facebook page. So just go to Facebook and type in my name. And I have an author page, which I think is facebook.com slash jasminesinger1, the Mm -hmm. number one. And again, there's no E on Jasmine. So we'll always post those there. Or again, just jasminesinger.com. And I'm going to be on tour all year. So if uh, your city will probably come up. And if it doesn't, then you can email us and we could see if, if, there's a way to work it in. And uh, you could also find me and our hen house at on Twitter. We are at our hen house or I, my, my personal one is Jasmine underscore singer. Mm -hmm. And on Instagram, our hen house is our hen house and I am Jasmine singer author. And then our website is our hen house.org that you could find our hen house, the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Same with the animal law podcast and the teaching Jasmine, how to cook vegan podcast. And yeah, we, I mean, we have a lot of fun. I hope people join us and come along for the ride. Sounds awesome. Well, we can't wait to read your book. And I know you already did your LA. Are you coming back to LA anytime uh-huh. soon for, a, for yeah. a book? Yes, I will be back in LA in August. I'm speaking at the Blog Her conference. And I am also planning another book signing there in August. I'm not I, I have like a 85% uh, definite on the space, but I don't want to say it just in case it changes, but I will, that will be the first weekend of August. I'll be there doing a book signing and speaking at the blog, her conference. So stay tuned over at jasminesinger.com for the specifics on when I'll be in LA. Sounds awesome. Can you leave us with a tweetable? I, you know, I'm always excited when people hashtag change the world for animals. So I would say, you know, just hashtag change the world for animals. Say your most favorite thing about being vegan or about or about animal advocacy and then hashtag change the world for animals and tag at our hen house as well as jasmine underscore singer and we will retweet it and that'll be fun love it so much thank you so much for being here jasmine we thank you for staying up late for us yeah, uh, happily. It was really fun talking to you. I kind of forgot you were recording. I thought we were just hanging out. I know. We're just having a good old conversation. That's- I've been on my I've been upside down on my head this whole time. How you- <laughs> Love it. Susie has two. <laughs> I have two. Yeah. Podcasting yes. upside down. That should be a new podcast. I think we could do that. <laughs> Definitely. All right, well, thanks for having me. Thanks for being thanks here. Thanks for being Jasmine. here. We have a special announcement. That's right. You've heard us talking about and hinting at some of the exciting things we're working on for you. Today, we are thrilled to announce the pre-launch of the Food Heals VIP Club. Not launched yet. We're going to launch soon. We want to tell you all about it now. The Food Heals VIP Club is a members-only club. It's a holistic lifestyle brand where Susie and I will teach you strategies and classes in the fields of nutrition, spirituality, and entrepreneurship (laughs) you know Allie's happy when she's singing those are our favorite things (laughs) those are my favorite things for real we love talking about them we love having guests on to talk about them and we love teaching them to you to learn more about what we're offering go to foodhealsvip.com should we give them a little should we give them a little taste of what we're working on Allie I think I think we should all right (laughs) we're working on classes developed specifically for you our Food Heals Nation so we asked you what you wanted You told us what you wanted, and now we're answering. 
The classes we are developing now include Dream Bigger, How to Become a Manifestation Maven, Yes, Podcast Greenlight, Marketing and Monetization Success Strategies, The Vitality Cleanse, How to Heal Your Body from the Inside Out, and we have so much more to come. Sign up now to be one of the first to hear about the launch of the exclusive Food Heals VIP Club and get a discount code for 20% off your membership for life. For life. That's like forever. I know. Like it never expires. Nope. Who else does that? No one does that. No one. Because we want to make it easy and affordable for you to be a part of the club. For life means you will get a discount for any classes we offer anytime. So the site hasn't launched yet. Please bear with us. We will have so many classes available soon. Just get on the mailing list. You can find out all the dirty details. That's foodhealsvip.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put down the Ben and Jerry's, get off the couch, and take a walk outside. If you experience any of these symptoms, tell your Facebook friends immediately.